Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden at Witts University in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon, Kobus. Today we're going to be talking about really the the the. The schizophrenia that people have about the Chinese, and this is not just in Africa, but it's about kind of them worldwide. There's these competing narratives, and part of it is because the Chinese put these narratives out there themselves. The one is kind of rooted in this peaceful rise. That is, that was a, a foreign policy doctrine that was created in the 90s by former Chinese President Hu Jintao, which was this idea that China was going to emerge into the world without the same type of conflict that other emerging superpowers in past history have done. So when the Germans rose, when the Japanese rose, even when the Americans came up into the world, uh, war usually was, fought, was close behind. And the Chinese recognized that their rise to become a global economic power, now today the second largest economy in the world, would not benefit them if they engaged in conflict. So there was this idea of the peaceful rise. Well, that has begun to change under President Xi Jinping. And there's this new narrative that's come out of a far more aggressive China. This is the Chinese who are taking the South China Sea, who are cracking down on civil and human rights, who are being much more aggressive with Taiwan, Tibet, who are now building overseas military bases in places like Djibouti, uh, and who are starting to assert themselves uh, as the world's second largest naval power as far away is the Mediterranean. So all of a sudden now people are starting to see, well, not really a peaceful rise, but possibly a mercantilist rise, a rise of a new superpower that is going to use military and economic force to assert itself in very much the same ways that past superpowers have done. It's important to keep in mind that a lot of this comes from how you look at China. The rise of China is a, is a chaotic and it's frequently difficult to understand process. And each, you know, different scholar, each different government official brings a particular lens that they through which they look at, at this rise. And because of the different lenses, you tend to get different ideas of China and kind of different Chinas in the world. Well, I've been studying China and Chinese now for 32 years. And one of the things that I have realized when you study China is that the minute you think you understand anything about China is the minute that you should just pack it up and go home because, um, you, you know, it's just far too big, far too complex. And I think this was what made, uh, you know, our discussion, you know, the topic that we're going to focus on today so interesting. Matt Furchin, those of you who listen to our show will know that name. He's a resident scholar at the Carnegie Chinhua Center uh, in Beijing for global policy there. And he specializes in China's political economic relations with emerging economies. And he also runs a program on China's economic and political relations with the developing world with a particular focus on Latin America. And we had Matt on uh, a few months ago to talk about Sino-South American relations as a way to kind of use it as a mirror to what's happening in Africa. And so Matt recently wrote a paper called China, Economic Development and Global Security, Bridging the Gaps, where he kind of talks about these two uh, perspectives and trying to, to understand what is China's role in the world today. Matt, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and welcome back to the show. Well, thanks for having me back. You open your paper with this idea of two perspectives, and I touched on one of them at the top, which is this peaceful rise. You talk about China's peaceful development paradigm claims that the country's pursuit of economic development will contribute to regional and global economic prosperity as well as security and stability. So they will not be a disruptive force. And that's very much this win-win diplomacy that the Chinese promote in Africa. And we hear that a lot. Then there's this other more sinister side which is that the Chinese are going to pursue their self-interest as aggressively as any power in the past has ever done. And that's in this very mercantilist type of approach. Let's start by kind of fleshing out those two perspectives and the contradictions that they kind of bear upon one another. Sure. So uh, on the Chinese side, the official framework for some time now has been this idea of peaceful development. And the, the basic idea of this is that China's own continued economic development uh, 
uh, is uh, it, it rests on a stable and open and peaceful international system whereby China can engage economically with a range of other countries around the world. And through that economic engagement, China's own stability and continued economic development will be secured. And at the same time, it will contribute not only to the development prospects and economic prosperity of all of its trade and commercial partners, but will also underpin greater uh, international stability and increasingly this idea that it will also contribute to greater security. And on the other side, uh, we have this rising narrative, as you mentioned, uh, that China is mercantilist, that it's a really a zero-sum game, that China is using especially new initiatives like Belt and Road, um, new institutions like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank to gain power and leverage at other countries' expense. Um can you give us an idea about where these these uh, two different ideas of China is the strongest? Like in which which parts of the global think tank world, academic world, policy world do these do the do the heart of these two perceptions lie? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it's very clear in the, the, the peaceful development framework. This is official government policy. It is uh, it's not only policy, it's also clearly part of the propaganda and rhetoric that China is using uh, to both enhance its soft power, uh, to reassure other countries, both neighbors as well as countries uh, like the United States. It's meant that you know, the constant use of language uh, like win-win is clearly meant to, to reassure. So this is very easy to locate the peaceful development framework. Not only is it the Chinese government, but it's also many actors academics and others uh, who voice support um, for China's role in the world. The geoeconomics framework that I talk about is a little bit more difficult to locate, but you, I, I say a number of pundits. Increasingly, I think we see this in some of the people who've been brought in to the Trump administration. Uh, but also um, some others, for instance, some Indian scholars uh, who are basically looking at China's, especially its economic initiatives uh, like Belt and Road, as, uh, as sort of aggressive part of China's growing assertiveness. And again, basically saying China's mercantilism is intended to and will create outcomes whereby China has more leverage over its neighbors at the expense of neighbors as well as the United States. You know, it's hard for to reconcile these two because, you know, sitting here in Asia, I'm here in Vietnam, where the framework of the Chinese is kind of positioned as extremely aggressive. Now, let's bear in mind that China and Vietnam have a very, very long history, uh, even in, in, you know, in the 20th century of war and of territorial disputes. And now in the 21st century, obviously in the South China Sea, there is a, a very large dispute going on between China and several of its neighbors. So, you know, from, from this vantage point, it's, it's hard to see the peaceful rise kind of narrative play out. But in Africa, you, you see the Chinese talk about win-win, as you pointed out. They're spending lots of money. They are really kind of laying it on thick right now with their, in, their environmental and wildlife conservation, saying we're here to help save elephants. And, you know, and so it really does play better there in that sense. But there's a darker side. You know, we just saw in Nigeria, for example, that the Nigerian government asked the Taiwan uh, government to move its trade and representative office from Abuja, uh, from Lagos to Abuja. No, from Abuja to Lagos. We see the Chinese kind of put implicit pressure on the South Africans not to accept the Dalai Lama for a visit. Um, you know, so these come in sharp contrast to this idea of the non-interference doctrine, which has been a benchmark of Chinese foreign policy around the world. And yet, so there's this hypocrisy that seems to be forming, at least on the part of the Chinese, that they say they won't interfere in the internal affairs of other countries, but they're selling weapons to Zimbabwe. They are su re supporting Robert Mugabe. They're doing all these other things that I've talked about. So if you're sitting in Africa looking at all of this, how are you supposed to figure it out? Is China the peaceful rise or is China the interventionist mercantilist? Yeah, I think the it's a it's a great comparison, and it's just one of the many we can make. But I think, and I do this in the paper. I say that one of the hardest places um, for anyone to to accept the the peaceful rise 
uh, scenario that um, is is being sold by China is its neighbors, especially in the South China Sea. And as you mentioned, countries like Vietnam, um, until recently, countries like the Philippines um, have for a long time seen rising economic interactions, interdependence with China, and at the same time have come to recognize uh, increasingly assertive policies um, on the military front and, and other sides uh, with China. So they're very, very leery of this. And as you mentioned, developing countries, including in Africa, but I think this is also clear for Latin America, there's been a lot more goodwill. Um, but as you say, there has all along, I think, among those who paid closer attention, um, there's been also a wariness that many of China's initiatives, that um, much of its discussion of promoting development in the region is also done so in a way that is meant to primarily benefit China. And at the end of the day, if, it, if these kinds of initiatives uh, are not going to be in China's direct interests, um, then it may pursue other options. And those interests may not necessarily align with those of countries in Africa, China, Latin America, and elsewhere. Kobus, this was a point that uh, Howard French brought up in his in his most recent book, which was uh, you know China's Second Continent, where he talked about how the massive amount of loans that are being given to the Chinese and Afri uh, to the Africans from the Chinese um, are are not really always in the best interest of Kenya and of Ethiopia because these are interest bearing loans, low interest though they may be. Um, they you know, the, the whole financing structure is really kind of not bringing money to Africa as we've talked about skills training and skills transfer. And a lot of this seems to be benefiting the Chinese far more than it seems to be benefiting the Africans. And so in that sense, you know, just to reinforce what Matt's saying is that maybe this isn't in the long term interest of the Chinese to be benevolent in Africa. Nobody really believes, I think, that they're being truly benevolent. Maybe the, the propagandists do, but nobody else really does. And so I guess I'm curious about what you think in terms of what Howard French kind of lays out in his book and what you're hearing from Matt today. Um, it's, you know, to a certain extent when, when not, not to, I haven't reread um, Howard's book for a long time. So, so, you know, kind of, I might be, you know, I might be misinterpreting what, what he wrote, but like at the moment when I read it the first time, I felt that it was, um, it was a little bit, um, how can I say, a little bit of, a, of an unfair um, comparison because it's not as if Africa was was being showered with financing from elsewhere, you know. So, you know, I, I'm not saying, I don't think anyone is saying that the, the kind of deals that Africa got from China are perfect. But it wasn't as if Africa was was throwing away perfectly good, you know, kind of mass infrastructure money from the from from the World Bank to just to just get, um, you know, to take this kind of bad deal from China. Um, the you know Africa was was stymied and stuck in endless kind of endless red tape from these Bre uh, Bretton Woods institutions, um, and they didn't have a lot of options. Um, you know, the, they they needed bridges and the bridges were not getting built, um, so they took a deal with China um, because China was one was the one of the few institutions was offering it so to a certain extent I you know the I, I find that 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 discourse a little frustrating you know kind of, and, and a little bit too flattering to the West um, what I would rather actually you know kind of move on to from there or like to make the connection to is to then ask the question to what has China really won um, because you know, kind of as Matt, as you as you pointed out in the um, in your your paper, in lots of cases, even in cases where where China is in a relationship with a much weaker economy that is very very beholden to it economically, that doesn't necessarily one hundred percent correlate to direct political influence. It doesn't necessarily mean that that China essentially plays the music and the, the the little country dances. Or am I am I kind of misunderstanding your your work? No, I think that's exactly right. And, and I think what you're bringing up here is this is complex. Um, and so what we need to do, these frameworks that I talked about, the, the Chinese Peaceful Development Framework, the win-win scenario versus the geoeconomics framework, which is more zero-sum, these both vastly oversimplify an already 
complex and increasingly complex situation with China's relations with countries and regions all around the world. So at the very least, what we need is better research, which links these the, the economic influence of China with its geopolitical and security influence. And surprisingly, there is very, very little of this kind of quality research. And probably as much as any region in the world, um, there's there's more of this kind of research uh, on China's relations with Africa. But really, we're still in the very beginning stages. So what you have is a lot of people with a lot of opinions uh, and very, very little good research upon which to base analysis and eventually policy. Let me run a conversation that I had with an American diplomat here in Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, this was about six to seven months ago, and we were at a um, at, an, at a social event. And we started talking about China, and, and I mentioned that it's you know China is now the second largest economy, and it's soon going to be the first and displace the Americans as the as the largest economic power in the world. And his attitude was, you know what? So what if China becomes number one? What does it matter if we're number one or number two? And, and you know, you hear this kind of nonchalance coming from the Trump administration as well. And what I said to him was, if the past 400 years of economic history is any guide to us, the country that is the largest economy in the world gets to set the rules, whether that was the British who invented the pound or the Pax Britannica, whether that was you know the French that made French a global and diplomatic international language, whether it was the Americans who set the Bretton Woods agreements, and so on. And so I said that it's just by definition that if you are the largest economy in the world, you get more influence at the World Bank, at the IMF. You get to set more of the rules. So now, today, we are in the era of Donald Trump, who is completely blowing up the rules. And to me, this seems disruptive for the Chinese, but at the same time, there's an incredible opportunity here for Beijing to reshape the global order in this period of flux and transition in its own interests, in a way that it could never have imagined to try and do if we had a, continu continu a continuation of the Obama administration, whether it was under Hillary or some establishment player. So I'd like to get your feedback on those two kind of points, this idea that the, f the largest economy in the world gets to set the rules and everybody else must follow that, mixed with this upset of the international order that seems to be coming down the line from Steve Bannon and Donald Trump. I think you're exactly right that this historical perspective is needed. Um, there's actually some quite good research among uh, people who study political economy about this question of whether or not the international system is more stable, or more open under what people refer to as a hegemon. Obviously, that's a bad word uh, for the Chinese. But, but I would actually like to point out uh, one of my favorite books of recent years. Um, and it's the historian Adam Tooze. Uh, and he has a book called The Deluge. And it basically goes from 1914 uh, um, up until 1930 or so. And what he looks at is the fact that the United States had already become the world's largest economy shortly after the Civil War. And yet, even by the time of World War I and then up through the interwar period, America, despite having this huge economy compared to all others in the world, had refused to or was unable to play a global leadership role in a way that was able to fend off World War I, Great Depression, World War II. So there is something about being or having a huge economic presence in the world, and yet it does not necessarily immediately or automatically translate into political influence. So I think we need to keep these in mind and how that process played out with the U.S. But your other point is an excellent one as well, which is that there is an opportunity now, clearly, if the United States under President Trump is going to step back from the kind of role that it has played since World War II, this clearly represents an opportunity for China. But uh, I'm sure, as you are well aware, many are questioning, both in China and outside of China, whether or not China is going to be willing or able to play this role or step into this gap. It seems to me that to a, to a certain extent the role of hegemon or superpower or whatever one would want to call it, that, it's, that itself will get rewritten. Um, you know, that maybe in, if we look back, 
what, what we came to think of as a superpower role that, you know, kind of that uh, I, I've seen some people in the U.S. Um, speculating whether China will step into, that that itself might be a historical anomaly or a, historical, a, a, a unique historical position that was created by the U.S., um, you know, kind of, and we might well see kind of new geopolitical formations being being created by China or by you know kind of East Asia as an economic kind of entity maybe in the future. Yeah, that's a, a great point, and I think a lot of people have already correctly pointed out that at the time, at currently, it seems that China's ambitions are largely focused on its own neighborhood, and I think we can see this. Um, with discussions about China's increasing assertiveness on the military or maritime front in the South China Sea. But we also see it with economic initiatives like One Belt, One Road, um, possibly with AIB, that China's looking to play a greater role in its own neighborhood. Obviously, this comes up against America's sense of its own role in the Asia Pacific and its own leadership and complicated history in the region. And Eric, as you pointed out, China's neighbors are not uh, about to easily, quickly um, let China take over this role without having a, a say in it. Um, but Kobus, I think you're exactly right um, that we that we can't necessarily map onto China today what the United States uh, has done. I'd like to kind of start wrapping up our discussion with, you know, a, a point of view that the Chinese don't like to bring up very often. But let's kind of say it all goes wrong in China. You know, I mean, China is a very complex, difficult place to understand. But some of the indications, the economic indicators that are coming out uh, of the mainland uh, are not good. You know, just this week, there was a report that China's foreign exchange reserves are down a trillion dollars. Now, they still have about 2.9 trillion, which is massive amounts of foreign exchange reserves, but it does show the cost of supporting their currency and the, the expenses that they've had to go through to, to balance out their economy have taken on it. They have potentially a real estate bubble or bubbles. They have, you know, questionable banking, uh, you know, non-performing loan problems. I mean, the, the list of things that Xi Jinping has to worry about every day, not to mention the environmental catastrophe that is underway in many parts of the cities, uh, you know, uh, unemployment among the youth. And so if there is a global shock to the system induced by Donald Trump or just globalization in general, China, you know, it's not guaranteed that they come out of this uh, unscathed. So what does that do to your theory and the discussion that you're trying to spark here if China really goes into a deep economic dive? Yeah, it's a great question, and I think it's one we all have to take seriously. And I think uh, certainly Chinese officials and business people and citizens are taking this uh, into consideration for sure. Uh, so part of one of my biggest concerns about this idea of painting China as a sort of geoeconomic or mercantilist powerhouse is it sort of assumes an all-seeing, all-powerful Chinese state capable of manipulating its own economic agents to do its bidding. And I think there's a, you know, a real problem with this and that it sort of doesn't understand some of the weaknesses um, that are driving China. China's foreign policy and also domestic policy, uh, and and it also um, doesn't sort of build in the possibility of unexpected outcomes. So China certainly faces major daunting tasks on the home front, uh, economically, socially, environmentally, and, and many others. And I think the real danger of, say, a trade war, for instance, uh, if, if, China, if the United States um, really starts to push hard on some of these issues and create a more competitive or even conflict-laden kind of relationship, it could push China into a corner where it's already facing major challenges. So I think we have to anticipate or, or assume that there could also be a lot of foreign policies from China that are driven by weakness as much as by strength. Kobus, one of the things that concerns me a little bit, and we've heard this over the years in some of the discussions that we've had, is that China may have an Africa policy, but Africa doesn't have a China policy. And it really re relates to the fact that there are not enough people on the continent who have an understanding of China, its history, the politics, and now this new world that we're going in, the new politics, and all of the different issues that Matt is bringing up in his paper, the nuance that he's calling for in understanding kind of China and the changes, and is it a predator, is it a partner? Um, and, and so I guess I'm worried a little bit that in, the, that in Pretoria, in, in Kigali, uh, 
uh, you know, all throughout Africa's capitals that that people just don't understand what's happening fast enough to to adapt to the new realities that seem to be unfolding. I share your concern. Um, you know, there's as as Matt has pointed out in his in his paper, there there isn't really a, a unified view of looking at China. There isn't a, there isn't a one one way of thinking about China's rise. Um, but it is incredibly important for Africa to keep these different views in mind, and to then also balance them with different and nuanced ideas about how to think about the U.S. Um, you know, um, Edward Said always wrote that one one of the biggest problems that he always saw in spending time. In, in the Middle East was that people in the Middle East, um, both governments, academics, and, no, and and everyday people, that they don't uh, know enough about the U.S. and so that their ideas about the U.S. is frequently are, very, are frequently very very oversimplified. And I think this is the same problem we're facing. Um, you know, as the U.S.'s role changes in the world, as China's role changes in the world, as other um, powers are coming up, um, we need more and more and more sophisticated ways of thinking about them. And I, I don't think that African academics and think tanks and so on are necessarily, you know, kind of keeping up with, with those developments um, fast enough. Well, a good first step is to check out Matt Furchin's paper. It's China, Economic Development and Global Security, Bridging the Gaps. You can find it over on the Carnegie Chinhua website. Let me spell that for everybody because it's not obvious. That's Carnegie, C-A-R-N-E-G-I-E, -E, uh, then uh, T S. I N G H U A dot O R G. Carnegie Chinhua Center. Uh, just look up for Matt Furchin's papers and you'll find them there. Matt, thank you so much for joining us on the show and for the work that you've done because I think it is important for people to start rethinking how we frame China in the global economy and the global geopolitical environment. And this is your paper is a great first step to do that. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. And if people want to follow what you're reading and writing and what you're doing these days, is there a way for them to follow you on social media or over on a, on a website? Yeah, the, the Carnegie Tsinghua site uh, is one place to start. I'm also on Twitter, and uh, hopefully I'll get around to updating my own personal website here before too long. And what's your Twitter address? Oh, good question. I think it's just Matt Furchin. There we go. I hope you know it. Uh, so Matt Furchin, F-E-R-C-H-E-N. You can look him up on Twitter. We'll include links to the paper and also to Matt's uh, Twitter address, just in case he didn't get it right. Uh, we'll put it up on our on, in the show notes of the show. And so, Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for Cobus Van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much. We'll be back again next week with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to Facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show or follow China Africa News that's updated every four hours, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadenesk or Eric at Eolander. That's E-O-L-A-N-D-E-R. Subscribe to the China Africa podcast on iTunes or download the mobile apps for iOS, Android, or Windows Phone. Just head over to your favorite store and search for China Africa. China Africa.